we've talked a lot about youth culture so far, from the Pepsi logo indexically linking itself with youth culture, to visual sophistry, to how logos convey a certain meaning using a visual vocabulary. But all these sections of rhetorical criticism have ceased to be at the vanguard. When speaking about modern rhetorical criticism, are we really speaking about media semiotics? Or do we mean something else? When we talk about semiotics from 1450 to 1960, we're really talking about print culture. When we're talking about semiotics from 1960 to 1995 or 96, we're talking about media culture. At the time of the 1960s presidential election, TV had yet to prove itself as a potent rhetorical tool. Having only been slowly adopted by a few, ad companies had always seen it as a niche, lower-impact marketing tool. But the 1960s, and more specifically the election between Nixon and Kennedy, signaled an important moment for culture in general. It would be the first time in history that a candidate would be judged on more than just their merits and past experience. For the first time ever, an audience could hear more than just the timbre of a candidate's voice. Many critics at the time underestimated the puissance of this new fad medium. But after it, we saw a relatively unknown Kennedy pull ahead of a well-known incumbent vice president. Most historians agree that history will remember that campaign as won or lost during that first televised debate. And specifically in just how old and how sweaty Nixon looked in comparison to Kennedy. This moment marked a shift in our culture as the moment that TV established its primacy over print culture. But now with the advent of the internet and the transformation of our lives by personal and mobile computing, another era has yet again trumped a long-standing primary means for semiotic communication. We have entered a new era. I grew up playing sports and slowly kind of got into fashion when I was in junior high, you know, I mean, it was a great way to uh, attract girls. It certainly set me apart from all the other kids in a Midwest junior high. Growing up, looking at magazines from seventh grade until, you know, now, without specifically trying to, I think you just pick up a visual dialogue, a visual understanding, and so it, it wasn't really the technical aspect of photography, but how it communicated to me, how it created certain curiosities to a kid in the Midwest who would look at Vogue or look at GQ and think, wow, that is really a different world. I feel very lucky to get to have part of my day leading a visual life. It takes X amount of time every day just to make the blog work, just to get everything going and get all the business of it done. But then the real joy of it is having those four or five hours a day to go out and just be in the world that you're in, see it, keep your eyes open and, and really relate to what you're seeing, react to what you're seeing. The fact of the matter is, you know, um, I didn't grow up dreaming to be a photographer. I didn't assist for anybody. I just kind of started doing it. So for me, it's so instinctual the way I shoot. The way I do it is just the way I do it. Excuse me. Sorry. Do you mind if I just do a fast photograph? Are you just standing just like that? Um, what's it for? I do a site called The Sartorialist. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good, 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 good. I don't see 100 images a day that I'd want to take. You know, I see two or three, and so for me, it's very easy to be patient and wait for those images because that's just 
the way I thought it was supposed to be. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I love yeah. your fight. Sorry, I didn't know who you are. That's okay. It's the man behind That's the camera. Exactly. It's always the genius. It's easier to recognize me looking like that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have Thanks. a good afternoon. Log, I can take a photograph and have it up on the internet and share it with people across the world. People of this moment can comment on how they feel that looks, how that fits in, if it's of the moment. I think will look very interesting a hundred years from now. Good. The ability to be able to capture that and how that attitude is going to change over hopefully the next 30 to 40 years that I'll be doing this capture something that we've really not been able to capture before. Great, thank you very much, I appreciate it, thank you. You know, because the internet is the world shrinking, are we all coming too homogenized? Milan hasn't changed, Paris hasn't changed, New York hasn't changed. So I don't think it's really homogenized anything, but I do think it's given us what I like to call a digital park bench. So many people you meet say, oh, I love to just go people watch, just go sit in the park and watch people. And before you were really limited to the people you could see right there in front of you at your park. Now you can go on the internet and look at a blog like mine or other blogs that are based somewhere else. Really the whole world's open to you now. How does our shift to digital culture modify the rhetorical model? Since rhetoric is the art of persuasion as Aristotle taught us, to persuade naturally you need a person to do the persuading, a subject about which to persuade, as well as an audience to persuade. But with the rise of digital culture, the relationship between these three has changed. As we all know, these three can be described as ethos, logos, and pathos, the three ways and means of persuasion that Aristotle described, commonly referred to as the rhetorical pyramid. The first way in which modern rhetoric is different in the digital age is that it collapses the artificial distance between the speaker and the audience. If you look at mediums like Twitter, they create points of contact between companies and figures that were before inaccessible. There is increased opportunity for dialectic with the audience to as well act on and shape the message. And this more intimate relationship with the speaker is an increased opportunity for pathos to enact on the audience an emotional connection that draws them closer to the speaker's message. Instead of the speaker's message being solely theirs, it becomes an ours relationship through the audience's participation. Being able to connect with brands like everyday ones such as Oreo and Burger King on Twitter and get a response from that company have been proven to increase brand loyalty. In the example of the short film that we just saw, when the sartorialist blogger wants to send a new message or post to his readerships, he just clicks a button and voila. Time is no longer a prohibitive factor in his ability to persuade his audience. The relationship between the two appears closer because it is happening in real time in a less artificial way. As soon as the blogger clicks submit, the subscriber's devices buzz immediately. Secondly, there are more audiences in this rhetorical model. Rather than a message just being limited to a small homogeneous readership, how for say, for example, Time Magazine was in the 1950s, 
having a large circulation but limited to the United States. The internet allows for many different audiences to be within the purview of the speaker's message. The speaker's ethos has changed in this rhetorical model because whereas in media culture, we almost had a hyper sense of ethos, a la Nixon and Kennedy's Battle of the Looks, in digital culture, anonymity has eroded ethos somewhat. Anonymity has eroded ethos as a tool of persuasion. When an article was written in the Encyclopedia Britannica, it had a certain ethos of legitimacy that could persuade you as a reader that the information contained within it could be trusted. But we don't have that anymore. With the internet, we are inundated by millions of articles, the authors of which are on the whole unknown to us. When we see the sartorialist out and about in the streets in the video we saw, even the people who love his blog don't know who he is, are distrusting of this stranger. He lacks the ethos, the sense of persuasion that comes with personhood to convince them of his identity. And lastly, we have how digital culture has changed logos. Using the example of the sartorialist, the logos of the digital world is exponentially increased. The topics about which people can speak, the ones that they choose to put on pedestals about which to discuss, has been radically democratized. A woman in a simple hat, like in the movie we saw, may have never before been cost-effective to advertise to millions in print ads, to buy television time to celebrate or even get up and make a speech about. But with the ease of digital culture, for the modern rhetorician, their logos, however quotidian, can be aggrandized just because it is important to them. Don't take me at my word? Well, think about it. How many cute cat videos have proliferated on the internet, not because they are important to talk about for society, or that a person thinks that many people will find them important, but only because one person found them important. Though digital culture has irrevocably changed the nature of the rhetorical triangle, and most specifically how ethos works, there may still be some pros about it. Though there is a downside to anonymity, and having a lack of a prohibitive threshold to put out falsehood, we can at least say that who gets to speak is democratized, and that there's merit in that. Through YouTube or through writing a blog, anyone now has access to their own platform that could be used to reach any one of a number of people. The blogger in our film is able to reach millions of people just from the confines of his home. Could you imagine if our blogger, for example, was handicapped? or didn't have any other way of having such a platform. As we see, there are no artificial constraints on who is able to produce a message. Last question. Do you agree with the assessment that, as we move away from oral and print cultures, we see a change in the structure of rhetoric so that, one, the ethos of the speaker is reduced, two, the logo, so the text takes a more central role, and three, the potential for pathos is increased due to the size of the audience. You can pause this at any time. Though there are substantive differences between the rhetoric of an image and the rhetoric of words, I hope this presentation has given you an insight into that invisible vocabulary in the world of signs and symbols that exists all around us.